Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, my name's Stephen Scully. Uh, as has been spruiked by uh, one of our uh, fintech specialists, uh, I am the Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner here in uh, Singapore for Austrade. And I have an illustrious panel who's going to explain consumer data rights down under and uh, how it's the home of the world's most comprehensive open finance model. So first of all, I'll uh, ask the panelists to introduce themselves briefly, uh, and then we'll move on to, uh, to the theme of this, uh, this, this session. So Ruth, you're sitting next to me, why don't you kick off? Um, Ruth, yes, explain uh, your companies, I think you have a couple now, and uh, you know, introduce yourself please. Excellent, thanks very much Steve. My name's Ruth Hatherley, I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Money Catcher. Um, we have a, a platform and a service that is in the consumer data rights space called RegChain Stride, which is the product we have um, promoting over here at the Singapore FinTech Festival. My company was founded about six years ago and the area that we play in or the space that we play in is being able to uh, digitise in a uh, safe way processes that are in and around mortgage data. So the mortgage data flow from um, application right through to settlement and then the ongoing reporting of that data for things like securitisation. And when the consumer data right came out in Australia, this was a really good opportunity for us to be able to leverage um, that legislation to be able to improve those processes. Great. Uh, thank you, Ruth. Okay, we'll go to Adrian now to introduce yourself and your company. Yeah, good morning, guys. Uh, my name's Adrian Float. Uh, I'm the CEO uh, of Spender. Uh, we're a software business. Um, we've been uh, doing supply chain uh, tech for about 20 years now. And I suppose uh, what we like to do is is uh, help companies with managing really end-to-end -end data flows around payments, lending, um, via ver various sort of uh, applications that we've launched uh, in the Spender ecosystem. I suppose really where our key value prop lies is our ability to construct a virtual ledger between buyers and sellers and allow them to trade in that digital community so that payments are a hell of a lot more than just settlement into your account. They actually come with reconciliation data that updates the ledger of both the payee and the recipient of funds. Great, thank you, Adrian. Okay, Vivian, uh, can you do the same thing? Introduce yourself and your company. Thank you. So my name is Vivian. I'm the co-founder and chief product officer for Callsgate. So uh, Callsgate is a privacy-enhancing technology company. What we do is we develop a decentral, kind of like a distributed cryptographic protocol to enable decentralized data sharing across organizations with a complete security, compliance, and efficiency. So now our technology is used to kind of like to accelerate this data interoperability in the healthcare industry. And we see there is a very similar trend in financial services, especially the open banking, because we see that the interoperability of the data across different financial services companies and the banks and insurance. So we see there's definitely the place we can add value. That's why I'm here. Great, thank you, Vivian. Okay, so you mentioned uh, open banking, open finance. So just to set the scene how um, consumer data right in Australia fits into that, uh, into that um, uh, uh, driver, can you just explain for the audience just very, very briefly open banking, please? Yes. So open banking from the word itself is open banks data, right? So the difference, a slightly difference is because the consumer has a right to do that. So basically, open banking is a combination of uh, regulations and the technology. Consumer is the center. Now, consumer can say, hey, banks, give my data to this application developers or give my data to this financial services industries. The purpose for that is for consumer to access the tailored the services and the product and also, especially in Australia, right, so the consumers can have a better price and a better interest rate based on the information they have with other banks. So that is open banking. Great, that's thanks. So, um, so Ruth, we'll, we'll turn to you now. So with that um, overview of open finance and open banking, so how, um, can you just perhaps give an overview of uh, consumer data rights, how it's actually applied in Australia? Yeah, thanks. Um, 
So the Australian government, uh, the previous government, the one we have now, decided that this needed to be broader than just finance and we needed to be able to give consumers access and ownership of their data and the power to share that data across any organisation at any point in time that they chose. And that the essence of the consumer data right is the consumer's power to consent how and when their data is to be used and for what specific purpose, for what specific duration of time. What has happened previously, not only in Australia but globally, is organisations own the data about the consumer. And if the consumer wants that data, they have to go and ask permission for it. And they'll be get given it in a document or an email or a paper-based form. And then they need to walk to the other organisation that they need to share that data with and provide it to them in that format. What the consumer data right is, is a legislation and a framework that enables the consumer to do that at the press of a button. So technology enables that sharing across organisations across industry and across platforms. And finally, the consumer data right isn't just specific to the finance um, sector. The consumer data right is being rolled out across many industries in Australia, starting with the financial services sector, moving more broadly into other finance areas outside of banking, and then into things like telecommunications, utilities, health, <coughs> other industries that are not related to finance, but need the data that is being held by those financial institutions to make decisions. Great, thank you for that. Okay, so that's the theory. We'll, we'll, we'll go to practice now. Adrian, so can you um, perhaps share how you're using, um, I'll call it CDR, Consumer Data Right, uh, in, in your company, please? Sure, so I suppose the way we look at this is the government's put in, in place scaffolding that allows an account holder to exactly as Ruth said, define how they want to, how and what they want to share with application vendors and other parties. And so for us, we're using that to really enhance our, our core service delivery. So our platform can operate as a true working uh, capital solution. So when we look at accounts payable or accounts receivable as an, an entity, uh, obviously there's multiple elements to that. There's who do we owe, uh, how long has we owed that money for, etc. But to actually really manage and plan your utilization of funds, you actually need to know what you've got to bank. You need to know what your balances are. You need to know transactional history. And you want to be able to share that as well with lenders to make things like limit escalation more simplistic. Uh, and, and they're the kinds of permissive things, I think, that, that Ruth's talking about in theory that, that we're using in practice now. So ultimately what that means is better workflow, better utilization of labor, better access to capital, uh, and a lot of these things, I suppose, uh, the scaffolding is now really putting, being put into production at scale and allowing the software industry to solve problems that it's done in other industries. And a lot of these tech plays are really just about collaboration. And so, uh, you know, right to access data, um, if you take like Facebook as an analogy, we give access or access rights to personal information about ourselves via the platform. In this particular instance, the sort of CDR open banking layer that we're using is allowing the consumer to say to us as a software vendor, we're going to let you see this information because it actually helps us to do, it, to do our jobs better. So in, in practice, really what we're doing is just creating the fusion between financial accounting software and banking so you can have a clean workflow that is, you know, create a list of people I want to pay authorize that event and then execute it at bank, which at the moment is very disjointed in a, in a I feel like a, a non-open banking environment. Great, thank you. Okay, so Vivian, um, we'll go to you now and sort of how does your, um, how does open banking and consumer data right impact your business? And because you're, um, you know, you're in the more security side of the, of the, uh, of the equation here, um, why should people feel safe? Why should consumers feel safe about um, having their data accessible under a CDR scheme? Yeah, that's a really a great question. I, I put it that way, because I, I know open banking is quite a hot topic. Everyone is talking about it. But if you really see the adoption, it's still quite low. One of the big reasons is 
I think it's the consumers' fear about security and data privacy. Um, the most recent that you, uh, like research has done by EY, they actually 48% of the consumers have negative opinion about open banking. Why? The biggest concern, number one, is identity theft. Second is misuse of their information. They say like, yes, I open my data, my bank data, give another application developer. What are gonna happen to my data, right? So, and also, if you look at the way for transfer that data is uh, open banking APIs. And um, so actually, API is like a pathway to vast amount of consumer data and their sensitive financial information. So there's hackers actually are looking at that. You can't believe in the last 12 months, those like uh, uh, attacked API traffic increased 681%. Is twice than the total API traffic. Why? Because those hackers know that's not like a honeypot. If they can access that information, wow, that's a lot of value. So what happened in Australia in October, like Optors, that's I think is uh, one of the high profile examples. So that back to what Callscape, what we do is we think that protect the PRI is a super important. The PRI is a personal identifiable information, right? So a way to strip out those information to make those financial services like really leverage additional insight to provide the better services is gonna be high value. So that's where we see like we can provide another layer of protection to protect the PRI and make those data more valuable and safe and more trust from consumers. So that's where we see close people help. Okay, so um, Ruth, perhaps you can share how you're using uh, consumer data right in your business. Yes, yeah, so the way that um, Australia has categorised data in our data standards and the players that are in the, I think it's probably important to set the scene with that first. So you have a data holder and a data holder is the organisation that currently holds the information about that customer or you as the consumer. You have a data recipient where you want that data to be sent and you are the consumer. So there are three roles um, in the consumer data right around how data is shared. Then there's a framework around how, which, what sets of data can be shared by whom and to who. And then there's a consent model around the only way that that data can be shared is when the consumer consents which data can be shared for what purpose and for how long. And I think that's a really, really important point just to follow on from um, what was being said before is at the moment when you want to be able to share your data with another, with another entity or another organisation, you go and hand your piece of paper or you send an email with an attachment. Do you know where it goes? Do you know how long they hold it for? And do you know how they store it? And I think the answer to all of those is no. Under the CDR, with the APIs, you absolutely, as the consumer, have control over what is shared, by whom, to who, and for how long. And it's law. It's not just a guideline. It's not just a policy that needs to be adopted. It's law. And so the government is protecting your data as the consumer at the same time as empowering you to share it to get a decision faster than you've ever had before for a product or a service that you want. So I just kind of wanted to clarify that before, say how do we use it. Um, once it is shared to an organisation, that's where we come in. So there are different roles for each of those different entities that play a role in this pathway of sharing data around um, for you as a consumer. You can plug in as a technology company at different parts of that. You're either in the compliance side, so you're helping the data holders and the data recipients manage that flow of data, and that's a really important part and a really first important first step. Um, that's not where we play. We play in the part where we're the organisation. Let's say, let's take the example of a home loan. You want to get a new home loan or a new personal loan or a new loan from a new organisation. Currently, you go and get all the paperwork from your existing organisation and you walk over to your new organisation and you give it to them and you cross your fingers and you wait for weeks or days until you get the answer of whether you're going to get that loan. With the consumer data right in Australia, you can stand with the organisation that you want to be able to get that loan from. You press a button on your smartphone 
that data is shared across for them to make the decision and our company uses our smarts and our engine to be able to provide the answer for that home loan in conjunction with some other smart technology there and then on the spot. So we provide what's called insights. So we don't need your PII data, and this is back to Vivian's point. When you share that information, you share the really relevant information, which is loan balances and transaction history and payment history. And I don't need to know who you are. I don't need to know your name. Um, I might need to know your age, but I definitely don't need to know your date of birth. So there's ways that we can mask the data and only take the elements that are really important to make the decisions for that particular transaction at that time. Whereas if you're giving that company your bank statements, it's got your name, your address, your postcode, all of the other information that's not relevant. So do you see now how CDR actually helps categorise and protect the data so that the organisation that's dealing with your data is only dealing with what's relevant for them at that time and completely controlled by the permission that you've given? So I hope that kind of makes sense. But we play in that space down there, but I probably thought it was more important to, to import that part. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Okay, so, um, you know, we're all Australian-themed um, colleagues here. So why should uh, the rest of the world follow us in consumer data rights? You know, and, and I think it's fair to say, um, as, as Vivian mentioned, that... Uh, data privacy, hacking and things like that is really a, a number one focus of entities such as MAS and other, other regulators around the world. Um, perhaps share some thoughts, you know, we've already touched on it, I guess, a bit about the, uh, you know, the adoption of the consumer data right, but how do you see that rolling out? You know, how can um, people in the audience sort of benefit from our experience? So, um, Adrian, perhaps can I ask you just to share? Sure. I, th I think um, once you define the rules and you, you start sort of moving to uh, a world where um, each player in the ecosystem actually owns their own information, um, you start to realise that that information in and of itself is extremely empowering. And so whether it's a faster home loan decision, uh, which, is, which is a fantastic example of, of a process which is, which is really quite convoluted uh, and doesn't need to be, and, uh, but it... But it exactly as Vivian said, it goes right across the ecosystem of digital sharing. It's more about people understanding that their, their identity is actually something that they own and not actually being in the dark about how many organisations are holding copies of that information. And so I suppose if we were to look at the Australian example, we've got a framework now. Uh, businesses can build upon that framework and actually deliver much better services. And uh, the way I look at it, it's not about the price. It's actually about delivering the right service and value for money. And a lot of the times, um, because uh, as an individual, we're, we're put through almost like a form fill process. Um, that form fill process in and of itself allows us to tell company A about what they want to know. But that might not be the right question. And company B might have a different set of questions and you're replicating that content over and over. If we can get down to, I'll call it agreed standards of the way certain you know, aspects of life are assessed, well we can do everything faster. And obviously efficiencies is, is, a, is, a, is a, I guess a massive part of uh, you know, the digital experience. Great, thank you. So, so Vivian, perhaps just uh, final messages uh, for the audience here about uh, CDR and open banking. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think uh, um, the final message is I think overall open banking is really great thing as a, for consumer, right? So the, the mission is really to empower consumer with their own data to get a better services and the be, especially I think for Southeast Asia, it's a better accelerate that financial inclusion. So it's very important. That's yeah, great point. And so, Ruth, perhaps just to um, close it out um, before some Q&A, um, you know, why should the MAS um, prioritise more open banking? You know, clearly there's lots of other uh, uh, priorities at the moment, but perhaps share with the audience your thoughts there. Yeah, I think um, Europe and the UK started with open banking. Australia learned from them and created the consumer data right and created a far more robust and rigid and reliable um, framework 
the government included um, uh, technology companies and banks uh, on the process to be able to design those frameworks, data standards and API um, schemas. And there is a lot of rich information here that we can share with Singapore. We have a wonderful economic and political relationship. Um, and ultimately the benefit is that the consumer has access to products faster than they ever would have before in a more competitive environment than they ever would have before and that their data is more secure and safe than it ever has been when making those decisions. And I think that that is something that the MAS would want to see delivered to consumers of Singapore and, and, and even broader into the ASEAN region. Um, and therefore, if they were to shine a spotlight on it, my understanding is that it would reprioritise the focus in the financial services sector and the banks themselves. And you're not starting from scratch. And with the political and economic relationships that we have, we can share um, information, we can share standards, um, and we can even share technology to be able to accelerate that adoption over here for them. Great, thank you very much. Okay, we, we only have a few minutes left, but are there any uh, questions from the floor that people would like? Yes, please. So if there is a country that doesn't have a data protection law, so can this scheme uh, support this country? Like support the, like for example, the APIs, like having uh, certain restrictions on these APIs that can be shared? All right, so um, your question is if there is no privacy law to regulate that, whether it's still She's saying, could the schema and the standard help replace or stand in, in, instead of, the, in the absence of any type of law in place, could the standard then take that place and therefore protect the data? Is that your question? Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you for that. So I think that the answer is yes. So basically the, the, the scheme, right? So it's like to regulate how, what the data to be shared, right? Um, but. I mean, this is more like a, a, a for my view, like you, you guys definitely can agree or disagree. So this is more like a, a, a rules to everyone obey. This is the, the same rule, let's agree this is the way we're gonna conduct our business. This is a process we process to follow that. But definitely the regulation, the law is just a double secure, like okay, if you don't follow that, there is a consequence, right? So I think this is more like an industry standard to be followed. This set a really good standard for that. So that's my view. I was going to kind of say, if you look at like carrot and stick, if that means any, uh, hopefully that makes sense. So the reward is uh, without having legislative power, which is the stick. So you can come in and say, bad boy, you've done the wrong thing, punishment, right? But the reward is to actually put the framework in place where the you actually create less points of vulnerability. So right now, if I give my information to you, great, and I could give it to you and to you, every at every point there, there's a point of p potential failure where you could misuse my data. So what, what the, the CDR opportunity is, is to actually implement a framework where all of a sudden, I'll say, uh, suitably equipped and trusted parties are the repository for data and then me as the individual grants other parties permission to use that data for a period of time. So I've got clear knowledge of what's being used, where it's being used, why it's being used, and how long that information can actually be used for. So, so it's, the law doesn't have to be there, but I think the carrot and stick works better than just the carrot or just the stick. And also I wanna add that probably it's a combination of the regulation and technology. Absolutely. Technology enable that, right? Sure. Okay. Um, I think we're coming to the end of our time. So, look, thank you very much uh, for your attention. We hope uh, it's been an informative session. And can you please put your hands together for the uh, for our speakers, panelists? who have done a great job. Thank you.